Hi everyone, it's Dr. Romney and welcome back to this YouTube channel on narcissism, narcissistic relationships, healing from narcissistic relationships, and let me tell you, we're going to talk about narcissism and it's one of its my it's most my most favorite forms to talk about it. It's to talk about succession. So let's break that down. My beloved succession is coming to an end. So I think it's time we take a long look at what may be, to me at least, one of the best, if not the best, narcissism show ever. For me, nearly a decade, Mad Men held that throne. And then came Succession. And I can say confidently that the writers of Succession know narcissism better than I do. They do not miss a beat on the subtlety of all the various forms that narcissism can take. And obviously the actors, each one more talented than the next, brought those words to life and crafted these characters in a way that no clinician or therapist or frankly narcissism researcher could imagine. So that's enough gushing. And while I am so sad to see this show go, I have to say it's always better to leave a party when people are sad to see you go. But here we are, about to tee up for season four, the final season. It's time we take a long, hard look at the various types and ways that narcissism shows up on Succession. Honestly, it's like a narcissism big box store. You can find every kind of narcissist and you can buy them in bulk. Honestly, every single character has some narcissistic stuff happening with the exception of the unfortunate souls who have to clean up after them. So let's start at the top of the narcissism family food chain with the big daddy of them all, Logan Roy. So Logan is a malignant narcissist, straight up narcissistic, moderately psychopathic, Machiavellian, and exploitative, where he will throw anyone under the bus and he is sadistic. He built this whole company up from nothing and a personality style like his served him well. You cannot build a media conglomerate like that by being agreeable or playing by the rules. Now, when we think about narcissism, we also have to look at how these folks function in relationships. And this man does not have one functional relationship. Every single one of his relationships is about manipulation, they're transactional, and every single person around him serves as a source of supply. Logan also shatters the hope that maybe if a narcissist gets really old and sick and has a scrape with mortality, that maybe they will find that heart they seem to have misplaced. Not at all. If anything, his failing body has only seemed to put more cruelty into his step. And he manifests just about every trait of pattern and narcissism we can think of. So what could be worse than this? Being raised by someone like this. And that takes us to his children. Let's start with Kendall. Kendall's personality probably best overlaps with a vulnerable narcissistic style. He is sullen, resentful, socially unskilled. He is riddled with anxiety and he chronically goes through the world viewing himself as a victim or presenting as a victim. He clearly has an anxious attachment style that plays out in infinite ways of trying to win over a father who has nothing but contempt for him. Kendall, like most narcissistic people, has little capacity for healthy intimacy, mutuality, or healthy relationships. He managed to get married to what seems like a normal person and they seem to have lovely children. And sometimes he shows flashes of paternal love, but with his kids, he still has more misses than hits. He is so obsessed and so absorbed with showing his father that he is worthy. And this honestly is how some of these intergenerational cycles get placed. Now, not unexpected is Kendall's history of substance use and addiction using drugs and alcohol to soothe him, or in the case of cocaine, to give him this artificially induced sense of grandiosity so he can withstand his own failures and cope with his father's chronic carrot dangling and future faking. 
He feels like the kid who has been the most broken by Logan. He desperately wants to belong, be seen, and have hip credential, but nobody in the world takes him seriously because they really do view him as a sniveling dilettante who's making it on daddy's dime, which only entrenches his sense of how uniquely unfair his life is, a very narcissistic pattern. Kendall is a textbook example of the invalidating, traumatizing, narcissistic father destroying the identity of his son. And that, my friends, is how you can easily generate a vulnerable narcissist. But then there's Roman. Something really went wrong there. Roman has this sort of malignant narcissism light. His comments and insults and critiques are so cruel and so contemptuous, but there's also a vulnerable narcissism piece to him, like an underbelly. He's anxious, sullen, mildly paranoid, and where Kendall uses drugs and alcohol to manage his fractured sense of self. For Roman, it is this sort of sexual cleaving off and sexual dysregulation and an inca incapacity to be able to enter into any kind of normal intimate relationship. Just like all of his siblings, he is manipulative and an opportunist, and there's a grandiose arrogance to him, as though he truly believes that he could be the one who is the Logan Whisperer. Every so often, though, a waft of humanity comes out of Roman. We saw that a few times with his brother Kendall, a sort of shared trauma experience. Nobody else could understand what this journey has been for these siblings, but as soon as any of Roman's humanness or vulnerability surface, his shame pops right up like a cork, he gets his grandiosity back, his entitlement, his, his arrogance, and that denial of his vulnerability, and he goes back to contempt and dismissal. Now, Roman clearly has major, major mommy issues and would basically give a psychoanalyst a lifetime of work. Again, he has that anxious attachment we see so often in narcissistic people. Relationships for Roman are about dominance, contempt, and like everybody else on succession, his entitlement and rich boy asshole energy pop out loud and proud and are probably his most defining feature. But then there's Shiv. Shiv, Shiv, Shiv. She is that combination of communal and malignant narcissism. It's a combination we usually actually see in cult leaders. Posturing as though she's doing good for women, doing good for the world, but she will cut anyone to get ahead. She is a tricky one because we do see her in a committed, intimate relationship, which could trick us into thinking, oh, maybe she's the one who's capable of relationships. Not so much. Her husband, Tom, is really nothing more than a footstool for her, only interesting when she wants to put her feet up. What is fascinating about Shiv is that she is the one who is by far the most similar to her father. She shares that strong, malignant, and manipulative and exploitative streak and is short of a 24-7 schemer. She's, she, she also is a cheater like her dad and a liar. She tries to play the family card a lot. We can't have like, the idea of, ooh, we can't have someone from outside our family run the company. It shows this fake allegiance to her father and their family, but everything she does is self-serving. Shiv may be the most narcissistic and toxic sibling, and really second only to Logan. I love Shiv's character because there's, the, the, she's portrayed, and the woman who portrays her, so beautiful, so feminine. It's an interesting sort of way they're using gender in the show as sort of the only prominent younger woman, and now how pretty she is, she's the biggest snake of all, but in a way, no one sees her coming. And then, ugh, Connor. Mr. I'm going to be president and run his weird farm and have his weird transactional girlfriend who's a pretend actor, and then he gets to pretend to be some patron of the arts. He's awful. He, like Shiv, is also a communal narcissist though, but this time with some grandiosity, the grandiose narcissist, and some vulnerable narcissism thrown in. He's also that holier than thou environmental guy who really doesn't get, get his father. He doesn't understand his father, but he still shows up to his father's stuff to keep riding the gravy train. Who in their right mind would give Logan Roy sourdough starter for a birthday gift, okay? I'm just saying. 
Now, like all of his half-siblings, he has zero capacity for deep, mutual, compassionate, and respectful relationships. His girlfriend is bought and paid for, and she cannot conceal her contempt and disgust for him. But she likes the money and the perks. Connor also struggles with the sense that he is not seen as the oldest son and perhaps as a heir apparent or a crown prince because he is the half-sibling to the others. And this seems to constantly throw him in a state of victimization, which he tries to offset by grandiose plays like either throwing tantrums or running for president of the United States. But once we come out of the toxic swamp of the siblings, we get to Tom Wamsgans, Shiv's husband, Tom. He plays as a vulnerable narcissist, but we come to see there's some malignant thrown in there. We see this combo in Roman as well, but the really dangerous part of Tom is that his mask is so good. He's sort of the bumbling regular Midwestern guy, which can be disarming. But Tom's unctuous behavior, he's always waiting in the wings, trying to win over his future father-in-law. It makes for a sort of dark horse thing. Tom, he is sort of the silent but deadly one. Everyone underestimates Tom, and that's a mistake. The narcissism in this family is so damned loud that a more subtle mixed type like Tom goes unnoticed. And that gets them into trouble. Well, because? Because. You'll see. And Tom does something that many put upon narcissistic people do. He is treated horribly by his, his, his wife and his in-laws. So what does he do? He bullies the people who have less power than him. Classical narcissist. And that takes us to Cousin Greg, the person Tom bullies. Now, in the beginning, you don't even know if you get narcissism vibes from Greg. He seems like a lost, overgrown adolescent. Yeah, you see a few ridiculous pot-smoking antics and being asked to channel his mother's entitlement about what he needs to get from the rich arm of the family. And Greg has some entitlement as well. Greg has these annoying, slippery, intrusive boundaries. He's the guy at the party who starts talking to you when you can't get out of the conversation or the guy in the airplane seat next to you where you ultimately have to put your headphones on so you don't need to talk to him. You feel sorry for Greg. You see him get pulled into all kinds of shady stuff by this family or just being treated so dismissively. But he keeps coming back for more and more, even as he sees the toxicity of the family system. In the beginning, you almost can't be mad at him. He sees an opportunity, he's young, but it's interesting to watch Greg grow into his own. There is an annoying but earthy quality to him, but it seems the more time he spends with the, with the Roy family, it's almost like a bad skin rash their stuff rubs off. And keep in mind, personality keeps developing until the age of 25. So Greg, as he was, his personality was developing, may have had some of that entitled parasitic Roy energy infused into his growing personality. I can see that there's more manipulativeness there in Greg than we think, and it's gonna get worse because of the company he keeps. Now, do I think he's narcissistic? Eh, he's a little too young, it's hard to tell. But he's entitled, and he's a wannabe. So to survive in that system, it is eat or be eaten. And it helps to become like the rest of the flock if you want to make a horse race of it. Now, Logan Roy's wife, Marsha, is someone we don't know a ton about prior to their marriage. Um, she's a bit of an opportunistic snake who has little tolerance for his children. I mean, who really would have tolerance for them? But she's also quite controlling. And instead of falling prey to narcissistic abuse from being married to Logan, which obviously must be what's happening, she harnessed whatever narcissistic defenses she had to get what she wants out of the situation. She's very cold, but being in that system would frankly drain out any positive emotionality from anyone, but she's shrewd like she knew what she was getting into and employed triangulation to get what she needs for her and her child from a prior relationship from this Roy machine. But not everyone's in the family. There's Jerry. You kind of get that 
throwback boss lady vibe from her, back when it was really, really hard to be a boss lady like her. You see that she gave, maybe gave up a lot of her life for this. You have to become a bit of a manipulative, toxic mess to thrive while working with someone like Logan, and that is Jerry. In a way, she was mentored by Logan on the dark arts of narcissism. We do know she had a husband, the husband died, but beyond that, we don't know much else. We can get why Logan's kids are a mess. They had this father. But Jerry is that cautionary tale. Most people would either be destroyed by the system or get out. But her superpower was to adapt and become of the system. Jerry is more of an opportunist than a narcissistic person. She's clearly manipulative. She's clearly willing to do the power grab and put up with Roman's crazy sexual hijinks. But not having those Roy psychological gen genetics may have saved her a little. The longer she stays, the more monstrous she'll get, though. But let's not forget our new friend on the show, Lucas. Lucas is the prototypical remote, cold, above it all, can't be bothered, I have a gorgeous house in Italy, tech bro. He has an interesting feel of that, clearly that hyper-controlled lifestyle narcissistic person. Everything just so. And this sort of checked out sense of him that we see in more neglectful narcissists who are capable of no intimacy, who can engage in social niceties for maybe a minute, and surgically get what he needs out of a situation, but emotionlessly. He doesn't feel psychopathic to me yet, but I'm watching his coldness carefully. He was able to play one game with all of the siblings in the, of the, in the Roy family, and yet another game with Logan. Now, whether that speaks to Logan's world-class manipulativeness, or Lucas's ability to work it, or just the synchrony of two dark tetrad types, I guess that would be a dark octagon. He's our new narcissist that we get to watch blossom. So thank you, thank you, gifted producers, writers, and actors on Succession. You made this narcissism obsessed, you made this narcissism obsessed shrink a very humbled and happy lady indeed. And I can't imagine a better narcissism variety show ever being this good again promise you stay tuned with me every Sunday night. I'll be there and in my head and heart and you'll see on YouTube, I'll be watching it with you.